Hello, and thank you very much. I'm going to start my story uh, on this big data. Is it a big help or big brother? And I'm going to start with my time here at Purdue. I came to Purdue as a, a very poor freshman. I had no idea how I was going to get through and pay for the whole thing. So my freshman year, I needed to look for cash. So I looked at the co-op program and said, this is a way I can go to school, go to work, go to school, go to work, and, and kind of get my way through school. So I was in the freshman engineering, and I started working for Corning Glassworks. And as that goes, um, if, if, you're a, if you have a science background, for my whole life, I had been trained about what's zero, one, right, wrong. So you, got, you took a test, and it was, you got an 87%, which meant that you were 13% wrong. If there were 300 people in a class, they were all looking to get to that one right answer. And so you were all degrees off of that right answer. So when I went to Corning Glassworks and I started working, and uh, I started getting to a place where, you know, you work with your boss and they give you some requirements and, you know, you, you produce something for them. And then you'd look at that thing and then somebody else would say, well, I think option B looks good. Now, coming back from my background, having that science background, the decision was simple. This was right. This was wrong. Choose A. B is wrong. And the, and the company would sit there and go, let's, let's try B. And I was just totally flabbergasted by that. I was like, how, how could that be? That's not that you just did the wrong thing. So I, I went back, you know, when I, you know, as a co-op student, I had the opportunity to come back to school and just start, you know, looking at what are the sort of classes I can take to learn more about this people thing, how people screwed up good decisions. So the very first class I took was COM 318, Persuasion. And, you know, as an engineering student walking into this liberal arts school, it was like my brain was getting open like a can opener. I was like, wow. And the grades weren't like I could figure out. And, you know, it was just difficult for me. And it was fascinating to me. And so the more I wanted to learn about this, this people element, of how they screwed up good decisions. And so I took a COM 318, and then when I got finished with my bachelor's degree, I was like, you know, I wanna learn more about this people thing, because I haven't figured it out yet. I haven't figured out 100% how to predict the human behaviors and the human outcomes, so I need to take more classes, clearly. Because when I take my master's degree, they'll tell me what the right answers are, right? So I started taking uh, master's classes, nonverbal communication, interactional pragmatics, rhetoric, oral interpretation, and my mind was just getting blown away because all of this stuff had to do with how people act, small group decision making. And so I finished with my master's degree in organizational communication, and I went into the PhD program in organizational behavior. And in organizational behavior, I started learning about motivation, leadership theories, compensation, strategic management, marketing. My mind was getting blown away for a third time in a third different way. And so for me personally, second child came along when I was in grad school, we had to leave. So when I left Cranert, they kind of gave me a master's of science and human resources, a parting prize, because um, I had been there for three years, taking the gazillion courses and, and past prelims. But when I left, I kind of think that was really good for my career because that was the foundation. And I stand up here before you today as an unfinished grad student from Cranert. And so I walked into Accenture and some of the clients that I've had over the last years, you know, you're, you're going to see some of these pop up on the screen. I consider each one of these as a case study because I'm not, I didn't finish. So as I go into each client that I've been at over the many years, I've been doing this for 27, 28 years, is what does decision making look like in this organization? How is it different than that organization? How is it working here? How do these executives work together as a team and how are these so totally dysfunctional? So I'm still collecting data. When I have it figured out and get 100%, I'll come back and talk to you guys and give you the answer, um, like a good scientist would. But these are the places I've been. And so I'm still learning about this people interaction part, this human interaction. How does persuasion work in organizations? So right now, I'm, the title that I have is I'm the chief scientist for sales and marketing talent solutions. And what that means is that I help my clients with their seller selling, and their marketers to market. What a perfect place from where I started my career here at, here at Purdue, saying, wow, how do, how do you look at a seller? The perfect thing of, of one person interacting with another and trying to persuade them. And so that's what I've been doing. And so now I look at that and I, I think about 
selling. Salesforce, as I found out over the many years I've been at this, Salesforce is probably the second most measured workforce on the planet. Because what you have to do is you have to figure out how much you're going to pay them with this variable pay. So there's so many things you can measure with a, with a seller. You can measure the volume that they sell, the revenue, the margin they make, which products they sell. Do they sell stuff that's high margin or low margin? You can actually monitor where they go visit customers, where they go, you know, on, on their routes as they visit. How much time do they spend in their car? There's so many things that you can measure on a seller these days in terms of these seller analytics. So what I'm going to present to you today is a concept called the seller analytic record, a SAR. So I want you to imagine, you know, there's a big spreadsheet in the sky someplace of, of companies that have 2,000, 3,000, sometimes 20,000 sellers globally. And on, they have a spreadsheet of some sort or a database that has a name. And they have in that name a whole bunch of records that they track on that person. And I'm not telling you something in the future. This is what every organization does with sellers. So this already exists in some way, shape, or form. So I'm going to give you a view of that. So look at the seller analytic record. And here's all the different kinds of things that they could measure about that seller. And I, as I go through this, now I want you to look at this and imagine your name here. You're a seller now. So we're going to go through this pretty quickly about what is it about me that you can collect? Well, I can do personality traits. I can collect your competencies. I can look at your performance ratings over the last three, five, six years. I can look at you know, uh, personality traits, look at um, your competencies. All these things I can track, and, and I've got this information about you. I can track your activities. So if you have a GPS, I can track where you've been. I can see uh, if you have scheduled meetings in Outlook. I can look at your travel routes. And, and even what keystrokes you make on your, on your laptop and on your iPads. I can look at the incentives, and I've already mentioned this, what volume you sold. I can look at your pipeline. So not only look backwards, but look forwards and say, so, so Patrick, what information do you think you'll put in there? And what will you sell over the next one month, two months, three months? How big are the deals? What's the probability of selling them? So I can put all of that in this seller analytic record. I can put information about my customers. So I might evaluate what's the strength of my relationship with customer A and customer B and how powerful are those customers in their own organizations. So you can measure the breadth and depth of the relationship that I have with them. You can look at the social style of customers. You could look at the customer buying history, their past history. You can look at the market. So I'm sitting in a certain geography. And in that geography, um, you might be able to look at zip code information and collect all sorts of good information on whether I'm in a growth geography or whether I'm in a saturated market for what I'm trying to sell. So you can put all that on my seller analytic record as well. You can look at the products and services that I sell. So do I sell stuff that's high margin or do I sell the easy stuff that's, you know, commodity? And so I can put that all in, in, in that seller analytic record. So again, all this stuff exists today. Some organizations are really mature and have all of this. Some have pieces of this, but every organization has some component, some element of this in their organization. So what I want to get to next is the not so distant future. Now we're all here about, you know, we hear about the internet of things. So let me start with, uh, in this not so distant future, you know, we can measure location. So now I can put on your seller analytic record, now I want you to put your name on that seller analytic record. I can see how long you stayed at that Starbucks and had that coffee. I can see if you were on a golf course and how long you're on the golf course. I could probably also track to see if you had a customer with you or not. So, so I can track your GPS on, 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 from your smartphone. Another thing I can track is your keystrokes on an iPad. Um, I helped a company once uh, go through uh, a new transformation. What they would actually do is on an iPad, I would sit down with a customer and I could go through a marketing presentation with that customer as a seller. And I could rate the page whether it was effective with this customer or not, three, four, five, six, whatever it was, and then turn the page. That information went into an analytics database that then they could then take how that customer and that customer segmentation on how much that customer bought. And now they could match, well, because of this marketing presentation, you know, looking at correlations and actually trying to do predictive analytics of saying, well, if we change this format a little bit, 
marketing could put out there a new presentation that would be more effective. And we call that closed loop marketing. Okay, so now we're starting to collect information on keystrokes and the evaluation of, of different pieces. You can assess my competence with Vocalix. This is another uh, amazing technology that I've, I've worked with. So actually, I could be talking to a customer and with an, an all, always on device, it could be measuring my Vocalix. And after that interaction, real time, right after that interaction, it would tell me the competency I had in that interaction with the customer. Okay, so I can say, yeah, Patrick, you scored a 3.6 out of seven on this one. Here's where you could have done better on these three competencies at different times during that, that conversation you just had. So Vocalix is a way to look at this. Um, you know, people have Fitbits. We were just talking about that backstage. You know, there's wearables out there. Well, now you have the Fitbit and now I can measure not only, you know, there's the GPS, but I can measure your stress level and your pulse rates. I can see if that's, you know, uh, if your pulse rate goes up while you're having a customer interaction. Why not? That could go on your seller analytic record. The next one, oh, uh, there's a thing called smart fibers that they're starting to put in t-shirts that I've just learned about. This is kind of cool. So you think about a smart fiber and it can measure the sweat levels in your, in your t-shirt and that also measures, you know, your, your stress levels as well, okay? But what's fascinating about this it also becomes a receptor. So I can actually send emoticons to your t-shirt. So I can make you feel a little colder, you know, a little warmer. So now I think about having that customer interaction and now I'm getting this emoticon feedback about what's happening in that customer feedback and I can actually react based on what I'm feeling with my clothes sent to me by my supervisor. Okay, the last one. We talked about wearables. I'm gonna talk about implantables. And implantables, uh, Medtronic does this today. They implant a device in you that measures all your uh, vital signs. The heck with Fitbit, why do that? Man, I can just put a chip in you and I can measure all that stuff. In fact, I can measure, if you're a seller, how much alcohol you had to drink while you were out playing golf. Okay, so now we're getting into, you know, all these things that I can measure. Now, still imagine there's this spreadsheet with your name on it and all these different kinds of things because you know, we can store this data and we can analyze it, as we know. So all this stuff is on the spreadsheet and it's collected for you on you. Now, you know, what I just described, that's, that's not tomorrow. These things all exist today. It's just that nobody's put these things all together. And so part of this is, you know, I talked to some of the sellers actually this week that I'm working with and I, I showed them a little bit of this presentation. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is so creepy. And, and I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll go live in Montana or something. I was like, you know what? This is not just not going to happen. It's happening. It's going to be our future. So part of this is what do we do with that? And I look out here amongst the crowd, and, and you are the architects of the future. And, and I like to think about this analytics is like the Wild West. It's the new frontier. And you guys are all in this new frontier. You're all in this Wild West. So... If you start looking at this, what's our responsibility when we look at this as sellers? You know, the sellers hate this stuff. Why? Because the whole reason why a seller becomes a seller is autonomy. Because I don't have to report into the mothership. I don't have to go into the office from eight to five. I get to go out and talk to customers and I have that freedom. But some of this looks like you're taking all my freedom away, but not necessarily. So the key question here is, do you want your name on that seller analytic record? And we can talk about sellers, but folks, this is everybody. It's not just sell sellers that are getting, you know, you're all getting tracked. We're all getting tracked by Amazon and Google and all those guys. So it's a matter of like how you pull that all together. So key question is, is, is this seller analytic record creepy or is it cool? Now I have a daughter and, and I, I, have, I get Wired Magazine every once in a while. And so I pull out an article out of there and I put it at the top, creepy or cool. And then, because she's a millennial and she knows better than I do. And, and she writes down there, well, dad, I think this is really creepy. Or I think this is really cool. So I try to get my read on stuff because, you know, I think everything's creepy because I'm a, I'm a baby boomer. But I kind of think of this as, is the seller analytic record creepy or cool? And the answer is, is a good consulting answer, it depends. Okay. So. It all comes down to intent. And I'm going to go back to the COM 318 class I took on persuasion. It all comes down to persuasion. And I'm going to make an argument here that technology itself is neutral. 
it's amoral. And data itself is probably neutral and amoral. But as soon as you start talking about analytics, now you're starting to talk about people putting intent into what they're trying to analyze and what they're trying to do with that information. And that's where the crossroads comes of whether it's a big help, which enriches my relationship with my customers or it enriches our human interactions with each other, or is it a big brother, which is monitoring and trying to control my behavior? So that's where that crossroads comes. And I think that's not real clear cut. I can make it real clear cut on a PowerPoint slide, but it's not that clear cut. But I would ask each of you, what is the intent? And you can't be neutral. You just can't be neutral in this space. It's going one way or the other. So I haven't asked for you. You know, you're all going to be out there as architects of the future, of our future world. And so I want you to stay conscious of the intent. What your intent is when you do analytics. What the intent of your boss is when they ask you to do something. And what's the company asking you to do? What are, what are they going to do with these, these analytics? Is it to control or is it to enrich the relationships that we are in? So, and again, I, I say you can't go neutral. The world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but it's because of those who look at it without doing anything. Albert Einstein. So we all have an obligation in our analytics world to do the right thing. Now, there's something that bothers me in our, our current world, and uh, it's about double negatives. And so here's a few double negatives. Do no harm. I hear that all the time. I hear, do no evil. And I hear, this one really drives me crazy, and I hear it all the time, hey, no problem. So Bob, will you do this for me? No problem. So it was a problem before, but now it's not. Why don't you just say, yes, I can? Why not just go on the positive side of things instead of being the neutral side of things? So I look at this and I go, so the second ask is, rather than do no harm, do no evil, or say no problem, why don't we just do good? Do the right thing. So that's my second ask, and that's all I have for you this evening. Thank you very much.